Amen. I'd like to invite you this morning to take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22 is where we'll be this morning. Um, today, well, as you can see on the screen, <laughs> we'll be looking at the parable of the wedding feast, which is a, a, one of the many parables that Jesus shared. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the, the parable itself. What does it mean? Uh, what's the interpretation? What are some of the applications of it? Um, and we'll kind of also talk about a little bit about the context of it and why Jesus is sharing it and what purpose, what relevance does it have uh, to the people who were listening to it the first time, but also what relevance and purpose and application does it have for us today? Because it is in God's Word. There's a reason that it's in there, and uh, we can learn from that parable today. And so let's uh, just dive right in. Let's just go ahead and read it together. I'll invite you to read along with me in your seat. And we're going to read uh, verses 1 through probably about 14. So Matthew 22 says, And again Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who were invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. Verse 7, the king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Let's pause for a word of prayer this morning. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for the invitation that you've given us to your son. We thank you for the invitation of the gospel, uh, that invitation to salvation, Lord, that is uh, has been issued to us through your Son. And uh, Lord, we pray this morning that, Lord, as we read your word, we contemplate it, meditate on it, that, uh, Lord, you would make clear to us the application of what, you, what it is that you're trying to tell us today. And Father, may we live in step with you, in fellowship with you. Father, we pray uh, this morning that you bless this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Let's talk a little bit about the parable. So the, this is um, really the third parable in like, uh, like within the last chapter or so of material. Um, so there's, there's several parables that Jesus is, is giving us. There's really, if you back up into chapter 21, there's two in there. And then now he's giving us a, a third one. And so this, uh, we don't know if this is exactly happening like in the same conversation Okay, because remember the, the chief priests and the elders of Jerusalem were um, they're in the process of rejecting, inspecting and rejecting Jesus during this last week of his life, his earthly ministry. Uh, they're, they're inspecting him, they're really subjecting him to this really close scrutiny and observation, and, and, and ultimately it will end with them rejecting him. Um, so these parables really are about that. I mean, that's really the immediate, just the, the interpretation of it is about uh, Israel as a nation rejecting uh, Jesus. And so really all of these parables, the parable of the two sons, the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, and then now the parable of the wedding feast, they all really have that same theme. Now, whether or not he shared all these in the exact same conversation um, or not, we don't know, but they were right in there kind of together, and they have the same theme, same general uh, topic. 
It's about the national rejection of Jesus by the Jewish nation. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody rejected Jesus. Obviously, there were many uh, Israelites who did accept, uh, accept him as the Messiah. We see the disciples. We know that others will come to faith in him later. But, but by and large, the people who were in charge in Israel, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests, the elders, the Herodians, these people who were in charge, influential, led the nation, rejected Jesus, who was their true king. And so Jesus is alluding to that in these parables, but he's also saying not only is he addressing the rejection, but he's addressing the cost that it will, that, that will be associated with that rejection, that God is going to take his program from revealing himself to the world through Israel. Now he's going to take up that program and he's going to reveal himself through the church, through the message of the gospel and through the church in this age in which we live. Now God is not done with Israel. We've talked about that um, you know, book of Hebrews and Revelation, and there's other places where we read that, okay, God's going to come back to Israel at a later time. But right now, for all intents and purposes, God is revealing himself to the world through the church and the ministry of the church. So Jesus talks about the, his rejection. He talks about the cost that's going to be paid, that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. God's going to take up his program with the Gentiles uh, through the church which is primarily made up of Gentiles. Um, and so that's really kind of the, the gist of this. But uh, the parable, it says in verse 1, chapter 22, verse 1, it says Jesus spoke to them in parables. Now a parable, it's been a while since we mentioned this, so I probably should say this. A parable, the word parable comes from a, a word that means to cast alongside. To cast alongside. So a parable is a story that has in it easily understandable components or a plot that people can follow very easily. And so that story, that easy to understand story, is cast alongside a heavenly truth or a, an abstract sort of a spiritual principle or, or something that, that Jesus is trying to uh, illustrate. So, so you got the easy to understand being cast alongside the harder to understand. And it's interesting that Jesus spoke in parables. So many times Jesus spoke in parables, and, and for those who uh, have, have faith, those who uh, Jesus is, like the disciples, okay, he's explaining them, explaining to them uh, deep and spiritual things through the parables. So the parable, all at the same time, is, is, is helpful to those who are willing to receive it, but at the same time, it's actually clouding the ability of those who are, like the Pharisees, for example, to understand the spiritual things. So at the same time, the parable of both is, makes it easier to understand and harder to understand. So it's kind of a paradox in a way. So for those whom, to whom Jesus explains it, uh, these parables are rich with, with interpretation and with understanding, with application. But for those who aren't willing to receive Jesus, the parables really cloud um, what, he is, uh, what he is sharing. It's almost like hiding the truth in plain sight. You know, so parable, a cast alongside story. So Jesus is, is saying, speaking to them in parables, and he says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to, so here's the, the cast alongside thing. So he says it may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. So he's, he's got this, this story of a, a king who apparently is very wealthy. He's preparing this banquet, wedding banquet for his son, reception. And Jesus said that that story is called alongside the, this truth about the kingdom of heaven. Now, kingdom of heaven has been a theme all through Matthew that, that Jesus has been explaining he's been inviting people to the kingdom of heaven that's been uh his his thing since the sermon on the mountain matthew chapter 5 he says he's talking about the kingdom of heaven kingdom of heaven really you know we have in mind we think heaven right kingdom of heaven is you know the kingdom of god is like this future thing that's like far away somewhere okay and and uh, that's really 
not a complete you know vision of what this is and so the kingdom of heaven is i guess the best way to describe it would be kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of which god is the king okay it's the one it's the kingdom that jesus is in charge of it is a kingdom that is both here now uh, it has ambassadors this kingdom has servants this kingdom has an agenda Okay, you and I, many of us are ambassadors for this kingdom. Um, it is not the kingdom that we see in charge in this world today. Uh, the kingdom, the, the world system that we see today is a system that largely leaves God out. Kingdom of God is this, is this kingdom that Jesus is the king of and that, is, that is, both, is both here now, but yet it is also future. It is yet to come. Jesus will come and he will rule and reign on the earth uh, and then we will see, like in its fullness, we will see Jesus sitting on the throne of which he is the king, the kingdom of God. Uh, so this kingdom is, is both not yet, but it's coming, and it's kind of already here now, and there are citizens of that kingdom living here. I hope you're one of them, okay? So that's the kingdom of God. So it's something that's kind of conceptual, and, and Jesus is saying, listen, it's kind of hard to understand, so let me, let me share it with, a, with you a parable. Okay, it's like this wedding feast that a king is given for his son. And so it says, he sent his servants, this king who's organizing the, the feast, it says he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. So I want you to think back for a little bit, you know, what we know about Bible times, we think about what life might have been like a couple thousand years ago. We probably don't even have to think back that far. I mean, if you just ask, ask some older folks who grew up in a, you know, last century. Sounds like a long time ago when you say last century. <laughs> you know, the, the young people are saying uh, some of the, like the young people, are like the generation, I don't know what letter of the alphabet we're on now. Is it Z or what? <laughs> they're they're calling it the late 1900s. <laughs> I'm from the late 1900s, but if you go back, all right, some amount of time, uh, we go back. You know, before this age of technology and and things were harder, right? There was a lot more work to be done, and so especially you go back to Jesus' day. It was primarily it was an agricultural society. And so they grew their own food. They were farmers. They were shepherds. They tended sheep and cattle, and they raised crops and vineyards and orchards. And, and if you know anything about farming, you know it is a lot of work. I mean, even today, even you got tractors and row planters and balers and all this kind of stuff. It's still a lot of work. But in Jesus' day, and before that even, farming was a lot of work, and it consumed most of your waking hours. I mean, farming was a, was living in this agricultural society would have been a big deal. I mean, it would have consumed your day. And so there really wasn't a lot of room for entertainment or distraction. And so in Jesus' day, not only did they have a lot of agricultural work to do, most people, um, but there was really like a, a lack of great entertainment options. Okay, they didn't all of a sudden finish, you know, milking the cows on Friday night and say, oh, let's go to the movies. You know, let's pop down there to the Red Box and, you know, get us a movie we can watch or let's go bowling or, you know, you know, you know something like that. There really weren't a lot of activities that people could engage in in Jesus' day. So, but what they did do that provided them some rest, some R&R, some fun was when they had a feast day. So they had like some time off. The Sabbath actually is meant to be a time set aside for rest. Uh, so you had Sabbaths, but beyond just the Sabbaths, they had feast days. They had, you know, certain holidays that would roll around and people would take some time off and they'd, you know, have a banquet and they'd have, you know, food and uh, wine and they'd, you know, music and, you know, dancing and all this kind of stuff. And so a wedding feast for the people in Jesus' day was most of the time was a very welcome distraction from just working all the time. And so the people, um, you know, when they would get married, the family of the, of the groom would throw usually elaborate feasts. It was, it was, they were quite something, actually. In Scripture, we see 
people giving wedding feasts that lasted sometimes for, for days and days. And so people would, would, would welcome these opportunities to, to stop having to work so hard and actually take some time off and to eat food that they didn't prepare, to you know, drink wine and have uh, R&R and fellowship with people and, and visit and you know, dance and just kind of take it easy and stop milking cows or whatever they milked back then. I don't know what it was. Sheep. Maybe they milked sheep. I don't know. But anyway, whatever it was. So they, they, they could take some time off and they could rest and relax and enjoy fellowship. So all that to say, this king is inviting this guest list. He's inviting them to this wedding feast, but it says they would not come. Now, that's our, our first indication that something's up here because people did not just ignore wedding invitations. Okay, weddings were fantastic opportunities that you did not want to miss in Jesus' day. And, and all the much more because this is a king who's giving the wedding feast. Imagine, you know, average person, you don't want to miss a wedding feast. Again, there's food there that you didn't have to prepare. There's time off. There's fellowship and all this kind of stuff. How much more awesome would it be if the king invited you to this feast? This is going to be great. Right? I'm, I'm definitely penciling in time off on my calendar for this. It's going to be amazing. But it says that they would not come. That's interesting. Why would they not come? Well, it wasn't that they didn't get the invitation. So notice, what, what's the way in which the king is inviting the guests to come to the wedding? It says he sent his Servants. Okay, so in Jesus' day and prior to that and after that, the way that you would invite someone to a wedding, or, or especially the, if you're the king, is you would send a live human being to that person who's on the guest list, and they would issue a personal verbal invitation. Okay, they didn't send emails, they didn't send save the date cards or anything like that. They just would send a live person to your home, knock on the door, and they would say, you are invited. It was a very personal, it was a very direct uh, invitation, and uh, there was really not any way to ignore it. Did you ever send something to somebody, and they're like, you know, you send them an email, and they're like, I, and I was like, yeah, I never got that. It must have went to my spam, you know, or, man, my phone's been acting up a little bit lately. I, I, I missed that message, you know. Well, there was no, nothing like that happened in Jesus' day. This was a personal, verbal, face-to-face -face invitation to come to this wedding feast, and it says they would not come. So it wasn't that they didn't get the message. They got the message. They just didn't want to come to the wedding feast. Well, that's interesting. Why would they not want to do that? Well, again, the, this is a, a called alongside you know, a story, a parable, and the interpretation of this parable, I mean, Jesus was making it clear that this is about Israel. Okay, that's the interpretation. Israel was on the guest list. They were the invited ones. Well, actually, I should back up just a little bit. Let's talk about this story. So that who, who's the king in this story? Who, who has the son? Okay, we're talking about God, right? So God has this wedding feast for his son. Who's the son? Okay, Jesus. And so... The first people that the invitation is issued to, the invitation to receive the Son, is given to Israel. So they were on the guest list. So, so God personally sent his servants, who were his servants, that, that prepared the way and said, my son is coming. Who would they have been? The prophets, right? The Zechariahs, the Isaiahs, the Ezekiels, the, you know, the Amoses, the Zechariahs, all these people. And so these are the servants who are sent to, to her to invite her personally, verbally, okay, without excuse. He, they're, they're being invited, and yet they would not come. And so the invited rejected the invitation to receive the Son. So I want to look at a little bit about why, okay, so why did they reject the invitation? Well, it says that the verse 4, it says, he sent other servants. So again, God, it's about Israel, so God sent more than one time. He sent prophets, he sent his servants to invite Israel to receive the Son. 
But it says they, um, he sent other servants saying, tell those who were invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. <laughs> Verse five, but they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business. So, so why are they rejecting the invitation? Well, number one, it seems that they are indifferent to it. First reason they are rejecting the invocation, invitation is they're indifferent. They just really don't seem to see it for as big of a deal as what it really is. Second, they're distracted. Okay, there's a, a level of distraction. It says, you know, they, they, they did not take the king up on his offer because they went to their farm, they went to their business. And then finally, there's a response of hostility. It says they killed the servants. These servants sent to invite them. It says they treated them shamefully and killed them. So there's a hostility in this response as well. So indifference, distraction, and hostility. So really, it paints a great picture. Jesus is, is talking about the interpretation here is that this is it's a picture of Israel rejecting her Messiah, rejecting this invitation to receive the Son. Um, but the parable has one interpretation, has many applications. Okay, so this is really what the story on the surface is about. Um, but in many ways, I think we can apply this to a lot of other, a lot of other folks' response to the invitation to receive Jesus. Okay, many people today, when they're invited to Jesus, Okay, personally, verbally, they're invited to, to, to receive Jesus by faith. They're being invited by the king through his servants to receive the son, and, and yet many are in, indifferent. They are distracted, and they're downright hostile to that invitation. And so I want to talk first just about the indifference. You know, a lot of times I don't think, okay, I don't think Israel got it. I don't think a lot of people today understand the importance of receiving Jesus by faith. You know, the Apostle Paul, uh, Peter, many of the others, I mean, they, they, <laughs> they had a, just a way of phrasing it. I love the way Peter says it. He says, there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. There's no other name. This is the invite with a capital I. This is the invitation to beat all invitations. There's not going to be a bigger invitation than this invitation. And yet many people are like, eh, I think I'll pass. I'm not sure I want to pencil in any time off on my calendar for that because, ah, you know, I don't know. It just doesn't seem that important. It's not a big deal. And we see that the king is actually personally insulted when they refuse to come. So there's this response of indifference. I just don't know that Jesus is really, I mean, I just, you know, I think God is probably just going to accept me like I am. You know, when I die and I go to, go to heaven and, you know, I think God's just going to let me in and, you know, it's just not going to be a big deal. It'll work out. It'll, it'll be fine. But yet, we see that the invitation to receive the Son has been rejected. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. So there's this indifference. I just don't know that it's that big of a deal. We also see distraction. We see that these folks really had something else on their agenda. So I want you to notice, what, what were the things that they went, that they went to go do instead of the, of the wedding feast? They went to their, I mean, my translation says farm and business. Okay, so those would have been the two major like money-making things in that day. Either you were a farmer or you were engaged in some kind of trade. Okay, those were the ways that people made money. So really, what are they about? They're about making money. They're, they're going and they're distracted from the invitation because they've got something better to do. And it's interesting, the response of the king, it says the king sent these other servants and he sent the, him to re-invite them. And notice what he says when he issues the this, this second invitation. He says this, he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited. Remember the ones who wouldn't come? Tell them, I have prepared my dinner. Listen to this. My oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Well, what do I need to bring? You don't need to bring anything. Just show up. Just come. 
It's already been done. The table's spread out. Everything you need and more. Better food than you have ever tasted before is prepared for you. I think I'm going to go work on my farm. I would rather raise my own animal. I would rather slaughter my own sheep, raise my own grapes and wheat and grain and cook it at my house. And yeah, it's not going to be as good, but, but I did it myself. King says, I've done it for you. I have done the work for you. It is laid out. It is ready. Come. Come. But it says they rejected the invitation. So they're indifferent. They're distracted. And then it says they're hostile. It says they killed the servants. It says they treated the servants shamefully. They killed the servants. Again, the interpretation of the parable is it's about Israel rejecting Jesus. But the same principle applies today. I mean, people are hostile toward the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ. And so why are people hostile to that message? Why do people not like the message of the gospel? I mean, it is the good news. Well, the reason is because the good news is it's offensive to people. There's, there's a, an offensiveness to it because, first of all, to understand that Jesus died for me on the cross. And that I receive him by faith. It says that, it says that I, am, I am now trusting what Jesus did to pay for my, my sin. And we don't like that word. We're offended by that word because I don't want to think of myself as a sinner. But yet, what the scripture shows us, if we're willing to look in it, it's, it's like a mirror. It really shows us who we are. right? It's, it, it shows us who we are. When we look into the word of God, we see that I'm a sinner, and it's not just the things that I do that sometimes are sinful. I am a sinner. It leaks out of me at every opportunity. It, it is who I am through and through. My heart is wicked, and we do not like to see that. We don't like to acknowledge that. We don't like to be told that, and it actually creates a hostile response, or it elicits a hostile response from people. They don't want to be told that they're a sinner. They want to believe, well, I'm, I'm pretty good. And, and, you know, I was talking to somebody recently and <laughs> having a gospel conversation with them. And I said, you know, we're talking about heaven. I said, you want, you know, are you going to heaven? Well, I hope so. Well, I hope you are too. So, you know, what are you trusting in? Okay, what, what are you trusting in? And, and what it came down to was the person is really trusting in that they're a good person. Okay, well, maybe relatively speaking, we might be good people, but we are all sinners. Okay, and we are not going to go to heaven apart from accepting this invitation to receive Jesus by faith. That's the only way that we'll get there. We'll come back to that in just a, a few verses, but, but it, it, there's a hostile response to that. Indifference, distraction, and hostility. So I'm going to look at a couple other things here. So notice the response of the king. The king is personally offended. Actually, I don't know what your translation says. Uh, in verse 7. Mine says the king was angry. Did you say angry? So he was angry. Okay, he is personally offended that his invitation to receive his son has been rejected for whatever reason. They're indifferent, they're distracted, for whatever reason, they're not responding. He is angry. And it says he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. So again, the interpretation here Jesus is calling this story alongside uh, an, uh, the spiritual truth, and it's prophetic, and, and it's already been fulfilled. So Jesus is saying, you know, there's, there's a cost to be paid for this, and it was. Okay, there was a cost. Uh, in 70 AD, so it was about 40 years after Jesus is speaking these words, the city of Jerusalem was destroyed. The city of the, the, those who rejected the invitation it was destroyed. The people, many of the people were killed. The city was burned. The temple was destroyed. The Jews that did survive uh, went out into the dispersion, okay, the diaspora. So they're scattered. To this day, they're all over the world. But um, there is a response of the king to this rejection that is severe. It's angry. And it sets the stage for what comes next. It says the king... In verse nine or verse uh, eight it says to his servants, "The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy." 
kind of a sense in which none of us are worthy of the invitation, right? But yet, we find that he, God is inviting us to the gospel. It says, it says, those who were invited were not worthy. He says, go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. In other words, go invite everybody. Every single person. You find somebody, invite them to the wedding banquet. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. And so here's this idea that, that everybody is invited. And so God, of course, this is a parable, and it's alluding to the fact that the church, the church is actually going to be open to Gentiles, to us, to everybody, anybody who will believe, anybody who will receive Jesus by faith. It's open to everybody. Who is invited? Everybody. Jew, Gentile, Greek, slave, rich people, everybody. Who is doing the inviting? Notice who's doing the invite. Who is the invited? Everybody. Who's doing the inviting? God's servants. That's something there to that, I think. There is an, an idea we said earlier that, that the inviting is happening. It's happening personally. It's happening verbally. Right? God is sending his servants to the people. Not that you can't send an email, not that you can't send a text message, not that you can't post on social media, but there's something about inviting people to Jesus face-to-face -face with words that cannot be replaced. The invited. Who's invited? Everybody. Who's doing the inviting? Hopefully we are as God's servants. We call ourselves God's servants. Are we inviting people to Jesus? If we're inviting people to Jesus, that's... That's what the business is to be about. You know, uh, in a few chapters here, we're going to get to uh, Matthew chapter 28. Six chapters from here. We'll get there in about nine months. <laughs> but it says in Matthew chapter 28, uh, the Great Commission, it says, Go into all the world, to every ethnos is the word there, every people group, every tribe, every tongue, every nation. It says, it says Go into... It says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, all ethnos. So to make disciples, don't we first have to invite people to Jesus? We have to invite them to Jesus before we can make disciples out of them. If they haven't received Jesus first, well, then there's no, really no need for us to teach them about how to observe commandments and all that kind of stuff. There's no point in that. We don't want to have people that are more moral, but they still don't have Jesus. Invite people to Jesus. That's what it's all about. We can't make disciples if we haven't first invited them to receive the Son. That's what it's all about. That's where it begins. So who's invited? Everybody. Who's inviting? We are. God's servants. And so we'll look at the next passage here. It says that it says they, the servants went out into the roads um, and they gathered all whom they found. Both bad and good. Now, understand here, bad and good, that's relatively speaking. Okay, it's a parable, right? This is relatively speaking. Um, bad and good. Uh, we know from the scriptures, we know that, okay, when it comes down to it, okay, there's none righteous. None of us are that good. None of us are God good. Okay, but relatively speaking, bad, good. You got rich people, poor people, all kinds of people you've got here. The wedding hall is filled with guests, but it says... Verse 11, when the king came in to inspect the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. He had no defense. He had no, nothing he could say about that. So a couple of things here. Again, this is a parable. It's a story that they would have been familiar with in uh, Jesus' day. This is the, 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 the storyline. Um. And, and, and so here's the way it works. So when somebody would throw a wedding feast, especially somebody who was high society, okay, they would issue a garment to people to wear to the wedding. It's almost like a wedding uniform, okay? So you don't just show up in your, you know, your shorts and your t-shirt and your ball cap, okay, to the wedding. Not for a king, okay? There's a dress code. You got to be wearing this, okay? Part of accepting the invitation is you put this on, you wear this. 
And, and so uh, this guy does not, he doesn't have the right outfit. But like I said, a lot of times what the people would do with the, the king or the, the wealthy person in charge is they would provide the garment for the person. Okay, you don't even have to provide your own. I will give it to you. You just put it on. So what is the garment? I mean, what is this about? I think the Bible uh, gives us a really good illustration. I want to read it to you. It's from um, Isaiah uh, chapter 61. I want you to listen to this. What is, what is it, the garment that we need to put on? What is this wedding garment? What is it, what is it about? What's it a picture of? So Isaiah 62, 61 verse 10 reads like this. See if we can figure out what the garment is. It says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Okay, do you see what the garment is that we need to have on? Do you, do you, do you see what that's a picture of? It's a picture of God putting his righteousness on me, wrapping me in his righteousness. The Bible says that when we receive Jesus by faith, not only do we have our sins forgiven, which is good. That gets us back from being a sinner destined for hell to being, okay, my sin's paid. But God goes a step further. He places us, Ephesians 1 tells us, he places us in Christ. He actually wraps us in Christ. When God looks at you and me, who are sinners, forgiven by the blood of Jesus, he also sees us as wrapped in the robes of righteousness that belong to his son. The righteousness, the credit for right acting. That's what righteousness means. God sees us in that garment. To refuse to put that garment on is to reject the son. It is to reject the Father. I don't need it. When I go to heaven, is God going to let me into heaven? I hope so. What are you trusting in? Are you trusting that you have the right garment on? I think I'd rather have Jesus' garment on because he was the one without sin. He is the only righteous one. He's the only sinless one. I don't want to show up wearing what I'm wearing. I want to show up wearing what the king has provided. Do you, see, do you see the importance? So back to our parable, what does the king say? Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. He had no defense. Why did he have no defense? Because the garment had been offered to him. Put it on. How do we put it on? Well, we receive Jesus by faith. And we stop trusting in ourselves and what we have to offer God and we say, God, I need, I need you. I need your salvation. I believe in your son that you sent him to be a sacrifice for me on the cross. That's who I'm trusting. I'm not trusting in what I show up to the game with. My faith, my trust, my confidence is in Jesus. What he did for me, God says, your sins are forgiven. Let me put my righteousness on you. And at that moment, we become acceptable, not because of what we've provided, but we've let him provide it for us. It says, come, it's all prepared. It's all prepared. So it says that this man without the wedding garment, it says the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot, cast him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So what was the result of the rejection of the king's offer? The, the man finds himself on the outside. It's a picture of hell. It's a picture of separation from God. And so we think about, you know, who, I mean, hell's a horrible thing. The Bible talks about it a lot, though. But there are many who are in, who are in hell who were invited. It wasn't that they weren't invited. It's just that they rejected. They don't, I don't want your offer. I'm too busy. I'm too distracted. And I'm too proud. I want to do it my way. Jesus ends the parable by saying, many are called, but few are chosen. Without delving into that super, super deeply. Um, I don't believe that God chooses who will believe and who will not believe. 
I do think he has given to us a free choice to accept his invitation to believe and have salvation through Jesus. Are we free to reject that? But for those who accept it, not everybody will accept it. But for those who will accept it, God has chosen wonderful and marvelous things. His feast has been set. His table is prepared. His garments are ready. He just wants to put it on you if we will let him. Ephesians 1 says that for those who accept Jesus Christ, it says that he has chosen for you to place you in his son. He has chosen to adopt you as a child, as his child. He has chosen to give you redemption. He has chosen to give you forgiveness. He has chosen an inheritance for you. He has chosen to seal you with his Holy Spirit. And we've, we've been invited to that. What a wonderful invitation. As we close today, God is calling you today. If, you, if you're hearing this message, God is inviting you to a relationship with him through his son Jesus. He's inviting you to that. He, he wants you to come. He wants you to participate. He has no desire for you to reject that. He has no desire for wrath. He will respect your decision. He's inviting you as if to a banquet. He wants to fellowship with you. He wants to spend time with you. He wants to provide for you. The provisions have been made. The invitation is open, but will we respond to that invitation by receiving it or will indifference distraction hostility will our pride will it keep us from accepting it i don't know i think we'll close there i think there's a lot more we could say but uh, i think probably enough for today <laughs> we'll come back to it next week let's uh, pause for prayer and we'll dismiss father thank you for your word today thank you for your invitation that you have given us through your son Jesus on the cross, that he died, was buried, and rose again on the third day. Lord, thank you that through faith in him, through trusting him, putting our faith, trust, and confidence in what he did, that we can enter into your kingdom and enjoy all that you've prepared for us. We thank you for it today. Lord, may we as your servants, Lord, if we call ourselves your servants, Lord, today may we be out inviting the invited to a relationship with you. Father, we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.